Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Naked Eye podcast. This is Nathan Oxenfeld, and I'm happy to be joined today by my special guest, Michal Mailer. She's a Paula Method instructor, practitioner, originally from Israel, now based in Florida. And she was also a featured presenter at last month's 2022 Association of Vision Educators Conference. So you may have recognized her name if you listened to last episode where I do a recap of that full conference. Uh, but I'm really excited to uh, be here today to learn more about Mikal's work and also to talk a little bit about the overlaps between the Paula method and the Bates method. So thank you so much for being here, Mikal. Welcome to the show. Hi, Nathan. Thank you so, so much for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm happy to have you. I, I was a big fan of your workshop at the conference, um, and I'm excited Thank to you. go through some of what you teach today. Before we maybe get into some some specifics and maybe some some hands-on or practical things, do you want to maybe take some time to introduce yourself in your own words? I think that I like to describe myself as a movement teacher because the Polar Method is basically a movement method. Um, my main interest along the years of teaching Polo Method was uh, women's health. So I studied many other uh, methods and techniques related to holistic women's health, yeah, holistic women's health approaches. Mm -hmm. And I do that. I work with many women. And then at some point I decided that I want to add uh, natural vision education to my work and I studied listening to the eyes with Anat Axelrod and so I'm all these things but mostly I think I'm a polar method practitioner so for me the polar method is like what ties everything together I think above all I perceive the polar method more as a philosophy or perhaps a way of living and I think that I'm tent that they tend to gravitate towards methods that, you know, relate to it and work well with it. And I tend to push away things that do not resonate with the method and the way I look at life now after doing it uh, or practicing it for so many years. Nice. Yeah. You, you also kind of took the next question out of my mouth of, of starting to kind of describe <laughs> the Paula method. Because I, I had heard of it before and I, I sort of heard it in conversation. It, a bunch of my vision students actually had mentioned it as well. Um, and so maybe for those who they're also new to it or they're not familiar with what it is, do you want to just kind of jump into explaining what the Paula method is? I'd love to do that, but I'll first I'll tell you this. It's a longer explanation for me, so perhaps I'll explain a little bit and then we'll go dive a little deeper, if you like, um, because I think that the Polar Method is, has two levels to it. And the first level is what most people know, and the second level is the level that I'm more interested in as a practitioner. Mm. So I'd like to talk more about the second level, but then just to get people <laughs> into the, <laughs> what is... What, what most people know about this method, so let me start there. Yeah. And then if we like, we'll go a little deeper than that. Sounds so the good. Polo Method was developed... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Polo Method was developed in Israel, in, I think in the 1940s. Yes, mid-1940s, maybe the beginning of 1950s. Paula Garber, the woman who developed the method, find out something very interesting that I think more people should know about in the world. I do know that there are yeah. Israeli doctors that travel in the world and tell people about this um, amazing finding of hers. Uh, but basically what she found was that there's a group of muscles in the body that she calls the ring muscles. Anatomically, they're called sphincter muscles. And this group of muscles have a very special relationship or way to influence each other in their work. So they work as one unit. These muscles are round usually. So let me give some examples for such uh, muscles. So we have our eyelid muscles, our mouth, the openings of the pelvic floor. These are 
uh, external uh, ring muscles or sphincters, if we want to call them that. And also there are many, many ring muscles that are internal muscles and are involuntary muscles. What she found out is that they all work together. So I can actually activate an internal muscle by activating an external muscle. Hmm. And the most important thing I think is that I can help rehabilitate or bring back to normal function an injured or a dysfunctioning, uh, dysfunctioning ring muscle by activating a healthy and well-functioning one. And that opens up a whole, you know, um, world of possibilities of healing the, the body. So yeah. I think that is the one level. <laughs> yeah. I love that philosophy of figuring out what maybe is kind of out of balance. And instead of just figuring, like focusing on that and be like, oh, I need to fix this directly. We actually look at, oh, well, what is already in balance or what's already working? How can we work with that? And maybe that could influence the outer balance part. So is that, is that kind of the idea as well? Exactly. That's exactly the idea. So she started developing exercises that would, you know, activate these muscles, both internal and external. And what came up from that work was something very interesting that we call chain reactions. Because we deal with so many internal muscles, all of a sudden she found out all the interconnections between the muscles and between the systems that they belong to. And these chain reactions opened a whole world of understanding of how the body works for her. And the uh, doctor that she worked with, there was a family doctor, uh, a family friend who was a doctor mm -hmm. that was very interested in her work. And he brought her to his clinic or to his, his office and, you know, gave her some of his clients to work with. And he was amazed by the results. So they started kind of uh, researching it together and he taught her anatomy so that they can figure out what's going on. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's how they got to the method. The chain reactions are the key to the other part of the method that interests me in my work. So if now is a good time or, or later, I can explain a little about that. I'd like to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, since you just shared the first part, maybe we could at least kind of touch on the second part and uh, we can decide if we want to just go into it now or kind of come back to it a little later. Yeah, let's let's kind of like touch the beginning of it. Okay. Yeah. So following the chain reactions in the body allowed Paula and other practitioners that she trained to help the students or the clients that came for Paula Method sessions to notice the connections in the body and also to help people really notice their body and create a deeper uh, understanding of what it's doing. And also she found out that we cannot force the body to work on the part that we wanna work on. Meaning that we might decide that we wanna work on, let's say, I don't know, breathing or posture or pelvic floor issue. But the body keeps taking the chain reactions in a different direction and you can't fight it. You have to follow what the body wants to do. You have to let it, you know, kind of accomplish what it wanted to do there. And then it will move on to the next goal. It feels as if the body has its own priority and we really have to respect that. So that opened up a whole other level of work in which we simply respect the body and allow it to direct the work. So. The, it comes to a point where really the body initiates the work and not the practitioner and not the person themselves, like the, the client. We just kind of start, usually we start with uh, hands over eyes or palming, as it's called in the Bates method, and we begin to sense the body. And then the body tells us we want to do this or that it wants to do this or that, and we follow it and we follow it. And through that trust, the work evolves. And that is something that allows people to feel very empowered in their process or, um, yeah, on their way to healing because they understand that only they can feel 
what's going on in their body, what their body is interested in doing. And so they have the power to heal themselves as long as they collaborate with their body. And that's something that fascinates me. And I love to do that kind of work with my clients. Wow. Yeah, definitely Mm -hmm. seems to kind of shift the dynamic instead of just maybe being told what to do from someone else. You're maybe giving people an opportunity to go within and tune into themselves and their intuition and that kind of innate inner healing capability. So that that does sound pretty empowering if, if people maybe feel maybe a little out of touch with that or don't necessarily know how to get in tune with that. But this whole chain reaction thing does sound really interesting and curious. It, it just, uh, if I'm, if I'm thinking of it correctly, it, it, what I'm hearing you say is that maybe by working with an external ring muscle, it will have a a chain reaction influence on, is it only on other ring muscles or is it on other non-ring muscles as well? Yes, it's, yes, (laughs) it's on other systems. And you might remember from the workshop that we did, um, that I gave on, you know, on the, during the conference, we worked on breathing, so we utilized or used our, our eyes to affect our breathing. And then there was one of the participants said, wait, but I didn't feel so much my breath. I felt more my digestion. And that's exactly the, the idea behind chain reactions. Mm-hmm. Her digestive system wanted to kind of take over with the exercise. So the activation of the eyes influenced her digestive system more and other participants felt the pelvic floor more. So really chain reactions are very individual yeah. and, you know, we can't fake it. It's, it just takes us to wherever it has yeah. to go. And we have to trust that. And what do you do if, if you go into something with that kind of clear intention of like, I want to work on this, but then the chain reaction goes somewhere else. Um, do you just kind of follow that and, and, uh, and trust that it'll kind of indirectly work its way to where you, that intention was or. Yes, I will. It it reminds me of an example uh, that I have with one of my clients. So she has myopia and on her first session, she told me that she has like a, um, this strong pain in one of her eyes. And so, you know, what the first thing before I, I approached the myopia, let me just first, you know, kind of tr- try and see if I can help her with the pain because the pain was very disturbing for her. Mm-hmm. And so we started with palming. And the first thing she felt was her digestive system and some activity there. We started talking and she told me that she had these digestive issues that's been bothering her in the past few years. And, you know, just I just took note of it and we allowed, you know, the work to take us wherever. And then I started doing some exercises with her because, you know, it was a, a new client. I didn't want to go into, I call the more spontaneous work. Uh, free form work that's the <laughs> English ga- name I gave it mm-hmm. um, so usually in the beginning I don't go straight into free form work I start yeah. with most people I start with exercises just you know to, to get a little feel of them of the method yeah no matter what mm-hmm. exercise I gave her the chain reactions ca- kept going to the digestive system and it just felt you know like well that's what we have to do so for several um sessions we worked on the digestive issues until it resolved and guess what once it was resolved she did not experience the pain in her eye anymore nice. and then we could start working on the myopia my- <laughs> right wow. yes so that's an example of course i'll go with it just imagine that i wouldn't trust her body and say well she has pain in her eye let's try to relieve the pain in the eye right but the body said something else. And because I had the trust in it, we didn't waste time. Like we solved the problem from where it, like the root of it. And the root was actually a digestive issue. Wow. Very <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that's a perfect example. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I think it's just a good reminder too, that, um, like you said before, it's, it's not just the muscles, but it's also the systems. Um, I think that was good for me to get reminded about. So it can be like the digestive system or the nervous system or the circulatory system or endocrine system, um, or maybe visual system. (laughs) Absolutely. And I do have, could I give another example? Sure. So it can go in both directions. So somebody can come with a vision or eye issue and we might solve it through another system or function or area in the body. But it can also be the other way around. So, And this happens quite often, but I'll give a specific example uh, with a client of mine. And that was before I studied natural um, vision. So I wasn't really sure what happened, but that's the story. Somebody came to me for breathing issues. And so we started working with the breathing and, you know, everything that's related to that posture and stuff. And after a few sessions, she told me that she went home. She got into her car, drove home. And only when she got home, she realized that she forgot, had forgotten to put on her glasses. And she had glasses since the age of 16, and she never drove without glasses. And so something in the breathing work that we were doing influenced her vision. She said her vision was completely clear. And from there on, she started going for her walks without glasses. She started using her glasses less and less because she realized that there is something there that allows her to see clearly. And it's definitely, it was definitely not vision work <laughs> that right. we were doing. So it can wow. go in both, both directions. And I see that many times with clients uh, that, that don't come for vision work. They come for other things. Sure. And with time, they tell me that they see better and they need to get, you know, a different pair of glasses because the one that they have doesn't fit them because there is so much improvement in their vision. Mm. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, once again, you you kind of took my next question out of my mouth of, um, you know, some of these either similarities or differences between the the Paula method approach and the Bates method approach, maybe kind of going in that direction. I'm kind of curious if, if you could sort of list off some of these specific sphincter muscles in, in and around the eyes. Um, if we want to kind of start to maybe target in on those. Cause I know that at the workshop that you gave, we were focusing in a lot on the orbicularis oculi, the big ring muscle around the eye. And I know the Bates method talks a lot about the extraocular muscles, the oblique muscles, the recti muscles. Right. And people also talk a lot about the ciliary muscles inside the eyes and things like that. But it seems like the orbicularis oculi kind of doesn't get featured as much. So it it was just really nice to give that muscle a lot of attention, a lot of self-care. But yeah, other than that one, what what are some of the other ones, uh, examples in the eye area? So I think we we mostly, we have two sphincters in and around the eyes. So the orbicularis oculi, of course, is the largest. Really, I I have a feeling that might be the largest uh, ring muscle or sphincter in the body. It is Mm. this large, like, that's the size of this muscle. Yeah. And the second biggest, or maybe bigger than that, is the mouth. That's the size of uh, the orbicularis ori, or oris, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Mm. Uh, these are like two very large uh, sphincters, or three, because we right. have the two um, oculi. And then the other sphincter that we, or ring muscle that we have in the, mu- in the eye, is the pupillary sphincter. And that is part of the iris of the eye. And that is the sphincter that um, contracts and restricts or influences the size of the pupil of the eye um, and restricts the amount of light that will reach the retina or will go into the eye. And so I actually want to say that it's very typical for the body to have uh, ring muscles coming in pairs or in groups like this. So we will have one um, external ring muscle, like the orbicularis oculus, and then another more internal sphincter um, 
like the pupillary sphincter in our eye. Right. In the digestive system, we have a lot more. So we have the mouth and then the anus at the beginning and the end of it. And in between, we have so many other ring muscles that are yeah. digestive um, system muscles. The same thing happens with the urinary system. Also, it begins with the mouth and ends with the urethra. There are many, many uh, ring muscles in between. The nice thing is that usually the external muscle is voluntary. So we can work with it. We can tell it to contract. We can tell it to relax. We can open it. Uh, although the opening work itself happens with other muscles, right? Like mu muscles around that um, ring muscle. But nevertheless, we activate that area. Yeah. Um, and so we can influence all the little uh, internal ring muscles by activating the external voluntary ones. Um, and that's, cool. that's just very powerful. Yeah. Um, I want to give an example. That's a, just a tiny example to show how they work together. So when the orbicularis oculus or the oculi closes in order to close our eyes or contracts in order to close our eyes, the pupillary sphincter will relax and the pupil of the eye will expand because it's darker, right? So we have mm -hmm. this darkness because the eyelid muscle is uh, closed. But then when we open our eyes, the pupillary sphincter will contract to restrict the amount of light that comes in. And that's a good example to how this, this um, unit of muscles work together. One affects the other and affects the other and affects the other. and um, this is basically the chain reaction that we were yeah. talking about before. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's just like right in line with a lot of what Dr. Bates was researching and discovering was the ability of the eye muscles to have both that voluntary and that involuntary aspect. And the the more I studied about eye anatomy and physiology and seeing how people were kind of, there was sort of this feud between Bates and Helmholtz, you know, there's different theories of accommodation and, and one has to do with the ciliary body around the lens, ciliary muscles. The other one has to do with the extraocular muscles. And it was kind of like, it, it seemed like the chain reaction was missing from that, that fight. It's like, well, the, the, the place that I ended up with, it was like, well, why why wouldn't it make sense that the extraocular muscles wouldn't or the the external ring muscles wouldn't influence those involuntary inner involuntary muscles and vice versa and and Absolutely. that's kind of my take on accommodation is it's it's a whole you know the extraocular muscles the ciliary muscles the lens the axial length i mean there's so many different factors there uh, so yeah the the chain reaction concept just makes a lot of sense to me. Makes sense, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. And I absolutely agree with you. And that's something that bothers me uh, sometimes with all kinds of theories that they don't take into consideration the wholeness of this. One thing always affects the other. And I think that once we believe chain reactions, it's, it's immediate because we just feel it in our body. Like sometimes people tell me, so explain that. And I'm like, I don't have to explain it. Just feel it. <laughs> it's happening in your body. You just have to allow yourself to feel it and believe it and see the results. And it's something that, you know, it's just, it's, it's in our sensations. It's in our body. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is the, mo I think that is why I believe that this is the most immediate kind of work. Uh, it's more, it's less here and more in the being uh, with whatever is happening. Yeah, maybe less thinking or analytical and more kind of embodied and, and tuning into the sensations, which can be a challenge for some people. Um, I know that I used to be a little out of touch with my own body and, and with my own interoception and my inner sensations and things. But, you know, things like meditation and, and these other holistic approaches have, have really helped me become a little more sensitive to that. and. I think it's neat that we're we're sort of like these instruments that can be sort of fine tuned and and I, you know maybe I was a little out of tune and I wasn't you know hearing these signals and like you said maybe even if I did hear 
a chain reaction or some signal, maybe I would just write it off or just kind of ignore it or not really think that it was important or had any meaning to it. So I think that's kind of a, another level to it as well, I'm sure. I really love what you just said. And I want to tell you that exactly that, exactly what you said, I was out of touch with my body and it took me all these years of learning yoga and other, uh, other methods that you've learned along you know, the way brought you to understand and feel your body more. And I think that that is exactly why I think <laughs> polar method is so important because it is so immediate. People make these connections so quickly during their first session already. And it's easy. It's right there. It's just we need that person there, in this case, the practitioner, to be with us and notice that and say, yes, it really does happen. I see that too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you and I see that you're activating one part of the body, but the other part is doing exactly what you just thought it was doing. I saw that. And it is, it's just such a, a simple thing that is a so empowering, but also allows people to be very authentic because once we believe our body, all we have to do is say yes to it. You know, if if my body tells me that it's tired or hungry or needs this or needs that, if I feel that I trust that and I know that this body of mine has my best interest in mind, I'll just do it. So I'll be a happier, healthier person. I'll be balanced. <laughs> and it's it's just there. It's only about believing. And I think that we live in a in a world that sadly really indoctrinates people to not be in touch with our body with our bodies. We learn to trust um experts to know what we need, how it's working. They know anatomy, they speak with all these terms. That's why I try not to use anatomical terms at my work. I want it to be approachable. I want it to be easy for people. They don't have to know what the name of a certain muscle is to be able to feel it. It's just there. They sense it. Yeah. Um, and it is part of what I think is the calling for me in my work to help people know, you know best. You know best. You're your best health practitioner. And don't let anyone tell you anything else. Don't let people tell you to do things that are painful for you, are uncomfortable, have negative connotations for you. Just trust what your body is telling you and your body will be so happy and will thank you. And the result will be that you'll just enjoy your life more <laughs> and you'll be healthier. Really, it works just like that. But it's for many people, it is a process to, to get to this to get in touch with the body and allow it to tell you, this is what I need and it's okay, even if it's not hard work. <laughs> right. Yeah, even just hearing you describe that and just kind of talk about what that feels like to live that way is very kind of, feels very grounding and very relaxing because I know one of the kind of personality traits that I identified with in terms of the kind of deeper explanations of refractive errors. So astigmatism in particular, sometimes people talk about mm -hmm. it being associated with personality trait of self-doubt and indecisiveness and just unsuredness. And, and what the way you were just talking sounds like the exact opposite of that. Just like having that self-confidence and just being sure that the signals you're getting from your body are accurate and that the answers are within that just feels that sounds really nice <laughs> and uh and it it I, i'm drawn towards you know pursuing that more myself and and just kind of trusting myself more um because i think you're right that there are certain societal and even even maybe cultural things that kind of get us just stuck up in our head and, and in our thoughts and, and kind of detached from our own human bodies. So. <laughs> I agree. And the human body is very expressive. 
really. It yeah. tells us what it feels and what it wants all the time. Yeah. And when we stop doubting it and we stop believing all the, you know, the external um, messages that, no, you don't. I remember that I once went, to, I apologize if it's too graphic, but I went to my gynecologist saying, I have an over, um, I have a very young infection. And he looked at me and he said, do you even know where your ovaries are? And that was so humiliating. Like, that's part of my body. Of course yeah. I know where it is. And I know that I have an infection because it's very painful. Yeah. <laughs> so people kind of learn. I even saw my daughter at an earlier age, went to some expert for some breathing. It's breathing related issue, but she did not have breathing issue. That's the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. And that expert taught her how to breathe, which is very different from my approach with the polar method. We do not teach people how to breathe. We help them re-find their own breathing patterns and, and deepen that. But we don't come from a place that, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you <laughs> what you're doing wrong. It doesn't work this way. The breathing doesn't go from the brain. It goes from, it's just something that the body does naturally from the moment yeah. that we're born, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I saw how she, she, she kind of controlled it. And she taught my daughter at a very young age to doubt her own physical uh, experience. Right. And that's too bad. And I think it happens to many of us that people tell us, yeah. no, 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 no. I know better. Let me tell you. And we have to learn to trust. And you also reminded me of something speaking about astigmatism. I'm very interested in astigmatism. And I'm kind of like making my own, own little experiment with that. When I have clients with astigmatism, I really like to tell, to let them kind of like, do whatever they like. And interestingly enough, I spoke to my polar practitioner or teacher, and she told me that she does something very similar. It just, the way she puts it in, into wor words is much nicer than mine. <laughs> so I'll tell you what she tells her clients. Um, she tells them, let your eyes go on a, um, on a hike. So they can go wherever they want and they can do whatever they want on a hike, right? Because when, it, when you're in, on a hike, you can even just sit on a rock and rest, right? So it's not necessarily that they have to work hard or climb the mountain or anything, but they could if they wanted that. Yeah. But that what it mostly allows is for the eyes to choose what to do with that time that was given to, to them and direct the work. And what I find in my work is that the eyes would naturally go to the angle that will correct the astigmatism. And it happens over and over again. And I'm just, I'm always so happy when that happens. I'm like, yes, I didn't even ask the body to correct the astigmatism. I only trusted it. And here it goes. I have a person walking in the studio, walking around, and the eyes constantly go in the opposite direction. <laughs> Of the astigmatism. Like, why would they do that? Because the body knows how to fix that. Yeah. Yeah, just trying to kind of undo the astigmatism by kind of going in that opposite yeah. angle. It's really interesting. Because, you know, the neck is already so affected by the astigmatism. Yeah. Especially if it, it's, it's, a, it's a problem of many years. The head posture, the neck. So I could, I could kind of try to give neck exercises or postural exercises that I initiate, but wouldn't it be a lot quicker and efficient to just let the body guide us through this process? So that's within the method, the two options that I have, and I have to play with them. There are some clients that I'm like, I shouldn't mess up this <laughs> by teaching them an exercise, let them just work. And others that I'm like, Actually, I think that if I'll give them an exercise now, it will enhance whatever their body is trying to do. Maybe once they know, you know, the right exercise, um, it will help them and they might choose to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just kind of working more with what, what they come with and, and working more with what you've already got versus trying to just pile on a bunch of new stuff and, and expect that to, to make make a big change, which it, you know, it could, sometimes we do need to implement those things, but you've said that word a couple times today so far of exercises. And I was kind of curious if you had any 
simple little examples or or maybe something that people could even maybe even try out as they're listening to to maybe even have a small experience with with this sure. or maybe you even want maybe to kind of feel a chain reaction or something like that absolutely okay but first nathan i will do that but it reminded me of something that i wanted to say earlier and it come to, come came up to my mind mind again so i have a feeling that it might be an important piece of information so let me just yeah. spill it and <laughs> then i'll give a little bit of um experiment so you were talking earlier about how the majority of eye practitioners tend to work with the muscles that move the eyeball and the ciliary muscle and less with the sphincters. And I wanted to say that we focus on the ring muscles, but we also have many, many eye exercises and exercises in general that activate the other muscles of the eyes. And actually some of my favorite exercises for the eyes are not necessarily contractions and relaxations or openings and relaxations, but movement exercises that do activate the muscles of the eye. Yeah, these are exercises that I find myself do on a daily basis because I also find that working with the eyes is the most gentle and precise work that we can do with our neck. Because if we let the eyes initiate the work of the head, and let's say at some point the head wants to follow the movement, the eyes are, are so gentle and so specific in how much they want to move that they will only move the head to the extent that is right for that person. And so the work with the neck will be very gentle. And especially for people who have pain in their neck, they will not force the muscles of the neck to work in a way that is too much for them. So if we tell people, just move your head from side to side, that might be too much. But if we start yeah. with the eyes and we follow the movement of the eyes, that would be very gentle. So we have the eyes. They are like the most accurate activators of the neck. And then the tongue can also work really well, well on the neck. Maybe we'll start our little demonstration with a tongue exercise then. Sure. What do you say? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, let's do something super simple. What we're going to do, we're going to stick our tongue outside of our mouth, kind of like we want it to be long and narrow, right, outside of the mouth. And we want to feel just what happens at the neck. But again, these are chain reactions. You might feel the work someplace else. So believe that. And don't worry if you don't feel your neck being activated, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're just going to stick the tongue out of the mouth. Are we going to do that, Nathan, too? I'll try, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll do it with you. And then we'll relax it and let the tongue go back into the mouth. Have you felt any of your neck muscles by any chance? Yeah, it kind of felt like more towards the back, back of the neck. Yes. I also kind of sort of felt like almost like my lower back, like the lumbar a little bit. All right. And the, mass, the exercise that you really wanted us to practice, this was like uh, a preparation for that. Mm -hmm. We tried to make the tongue long and narrow, right? Poke, right? Poking it out of the mouth. Now I would like the tongue to stay in the mouth and I would like it to be short and wide. Okay, so we're widening the tongue and making it as short as we can. And then we relax it. And when we want to, and if we feel like we like it, we can do it again. We're going to make our tongue large and our wide and short. And relax. And this might have caused a different reaction in the neck, right? You want to try it a little longer to feel that? Yeah. I'm feeling it more kind of on the sides um, versus before it was more kind of on the back when when it's doing the long and narrow. Let's do another one then. I don't know why I even started with tongue uh, exercises. It's not very typical for me. Let's, never mind. Let's do another one. 
we're going to take the, the tongue and we're going to kind of stroke the roof of our, of our mouth with our tongue. So we start behind the top teeth and we stroke along the roof of the mouth as back as we can take it, right? We're not going to force it in any way. We're just going back and relaxing. And then again, from the uh, front teeth, stroking back. Let's try that. Just with the tip of the tongue? Just with the tip of the tongue. A very simple one. How is it feeling? It's really interesting. <laughs> it, it kind of had this multi-directional pull. So it, it originally brought me up. So like my eyes wanted to look up and I it kind of connected me up more with the top of my head. And then as I kept doing it more and more, I actually started feeling more like the pelvic floor area. Mm -hmm. And did it affect your spine in any way? Did it do anything to your neck? It it seemed like it it made me want to kind of straighten up. Yeah, sit up a little bit compared to before. Yeah, good. I'm glad you felt all of these things. And yes, it is related to the pelvic floor. We kind of believe that everything begins at the pelvic floor. <laughs> mm -hmm. All movement, everything, our voice, our posture, our breathing, our everything really, every movement. Um uh, begins at the pelvic floor and if we understand how the pelvic floor works correctly then we can enhance all our movements and our work to be a lot more efficient would you like us to try another exercise or was this enough sure i'm i'm down for another yeah yeah <laughs> okay it's going to be two exercises we'll start with the one and then we'll add another one to the work okay mm -hmm. we're going to I think I did that at the conference now that I'm thinking, but never mind. It doesn't matter because, you know, the viewers or the listeners here are different people. So what we're going to do, we're going to try and activate our eyebrows. Okay. So what we're going to try is to bring the eyebrows up so that they go up towards the hairline. Okay. So we draw, we drive, we draw them up. We keep them there for as long as we like, and then we relax them and let them go back to their neutral position. And again, we'll draw them up and allow them to relax when we feel that we want to do so. So it's very important that we follow our own timing, our own pace. We draw them up whenever we like, and we relax them whenever we like. Just continue a little longer and see how it feels. Good. One thing that's important about chain reactions, we don't ever isolate movements. So whatever it is that the face want to do, the shoulders, the rest of the body wants to do while we activate one part, for instance, now the eyebrows, we always say yes. We don't tell ourselves, no, no, no. She said to activate the eyebrows. Not, let's not do anything else. We okay. can definitely let every other part of the body join in. All righty. What did, how did it feel? Well, that's just such an interesting tip you just shared because I, I normally teach the eyebrow raises uh, like we just did as part of like one of the morning routines people can do like when they wake up in the morning to help kind of wake their eyes up, like lift the eyebrows up, let them relax down. But really? I, I think in the past, I really had an intention to really isolate that and like separate the movement of the eyebrows from the eyes or other muscles. So to kind of not do that and just let other things happen felt much different than normal. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I was noticing my and eyes. Did you any chain reactions? Yeah, my eyes were kind of floating up. Um, that one, I was, I was feeling it kind of in my shoulders as well. Wanting to kind of shrug the shoulders up as the eyebrows went up. Um, mm -hmm. And also a little, yeah, a little influence on my posture, just kind of how I was sitting in my chair. 
All righty. So I want to add something to that. Okay, we're going to activate the hands now. So if you like, you can even place your hands in your in your lap, facing up. Whatever feels most comfortable for you. I'm going to face them up. So the palms are facing to the ceiling. And I'm going to activate my uh, hands now. What I'm going to do, I'm going to draw the fingers away from each other. So the thumb and the, the pinky go in different opposite directions and the rest of the fingers kind of spread up between them. And then I'm going to relax and let the fingers go back to their neutral position. And then again, I'm going to spread the fingers away from each other and relax them whenever I like. If anyone that's listening to us feel that this is too strenuous, do not go to the extent. And also please maybe try to uh, let the palms face down to your lap. Maybe that would be helpful. We don't want to stress or cause any discomfort to any part of the body during this kind of work. And what I would like us to do now is to do both exercises at the same time. So we're going to draw the eyebrows up towards the hairline, spread the fingers, and relax the eyebrows and the fingers at the same time. And you're going to continue at your own pace, drawing the eyebrows up, spreading the fingers away from each other, and relax and let them rest for as long as they want. Just practice on your own, I'll be quiet so you can feel it. <laughs> Let's do one last round. And later on, just know that you can repeat any of these exercises on your own, uh, you know, whenever you like. <laughs> Except for poking the tongue. <laughs> Most of the exercises can be practiced everywhere. <laughs> yeah. How did it feel, Nathan? Did it feel different when you uh, incorporated the work of the fingers with the work of the eyebrows? It seemed to kind of instantly bring my breath into the picture. So I feel like having to do the hands and the eyebrows simultaneously for some reason made my lungs and my breathing just like get in sync with that. Whereas when we were just doing the eyebrows and the tongue things, like I was not even really as aware of my breathing pattern. Um, yeah. So that, that was definitely the first thing I noticed. And then just sort of, I was noticing sort of a constriction of the back of my neck when I would lift the eyebrows up and spread the fingers. And then when I would re relax everything, then the back of my neck would kind of relax and I would find more like space in my upper like cervical spine. So question for you. I, since I noticed that the first couple times and you were having me kind of repeat it, would you, would you say that I should just keep letting that occur and just let, let the body respond in that kind of natural way? Or cause I found myself wanting to kind of keep that spaciousness there even as i did the movements but then it kind of felt like i was changing what my body want needed to do or wanted to do so is that something that people kind of struggle with of kind of wanting to like influence it or control it maybe um i don't know maybe but what i wanted to tell you is that i think that if you'd practice this exercise lying down you'll experience mm. it a little different right yeah and also <laughs> that sometimes certain exercises are not exactly what that specific person needs mm -hmm. and then maybe that's not the most important work for you you know right. i was yeah. just trying to work a little bit with the chain reactions and indeed all the chain reactions that you've you've noticed and mentioned are very true and mm -hmm. yes and when we we uh expand and inhale and our shoulders go back it is also that the neck kind of like you know uh, uh contracts back backward right and then when we exhale it's in the opposite direction so it's all true the question is why was it uncomfortable right. and i don't want to tell you that i was watching you as you were doing the eye exercise the eyebrows 
uh, part of the exercise. And there was a lot of restriction in the face. And mm -hmm. once we added the fingers, all of a sudden there was a lot of movement in your face, perhaps because I also mentioned that you don't have to yeah. <laughs> isolate the movement. Right. And all of a sudden a lot happened. So let's say if we were during a private session, I'd explore that with you. Oh, like I see. What, what right. movements in the, in, the, in the face? And I would tell you, don't stop that. Just continue mm -hmm. with that. And we'd see where it take us or take you. Right. Uh, that's very interesting. But the moment we let go of restrictions, isolations, and uh, all kinds of thoughts that we've learned from other methods, and we just let the body tell us how it feels, what it wants to do, what it doesn't like to do so much. Uh, it opens up many opportunities and um, people sometimes are very surprised when they're like, oh, I've been doing this for a long while, but this just brings it, you know, um, to another, um, I don't know, people just experience it differently when we do it this way. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. all your um, reactions. It's sometimes very personal, so I really appreciate it that you do it live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks for walking through. And I'm sure maybe people listening were, were following along and maybe having their own experience with it as well. So that's absolutely one of one of the things that I uh, often tend to do is to help people feel how each part of their eyelid muscle affects the pelvic floor. This is a fascinating uh, experiment with chain reactions. I just thought that I want to do things that are more immediate today. So maybe at another, I don't know, maybe at another conference, I'll focus on that instead of on breathing, the connection between the eyes and the pelvic floor, because that's just fascinating. We can feel every little different part of the eyelid uh, activating uh, the pelvic floor. Mm, wow. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. And, and that, also kind of reminds me since uh, one of the other speakers from the conference, Peter Grinwald, the the whole eye body map of of the connection with the macula and the sits bones, the seat bones, and uh, and yeah, just this link between like our 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 root, you know, the the root area, and then the the eyes and the brain up more towards the top. Love this whole this whole concept of of feeling the connections and really mapping our own bodies out and really getting to know ourselves on these subtler levels. Yeah. Plus it gives a lot of information about people, you know, you can't stop analyzing their faces or expressions and knowing how it affects the rest of their bodies. It's just fascinating. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love work. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I think another one of those kind of overlaps between between the Paula method and the Bates method is I love what you said earlier of you don't have to necessarily know the name of the muscle to be able to feel it, and that was the impression that I also got about the Bates method. Although when you do research the original materials and in, in Dr. Bates's work, it does seem kind of a little more medical or scientific and. He's listing all the actual anatomical terms and names and everything, but most other books <laughs> about natural vision improvement that came after Bates, uh, you know, even just like Margaret Corbett's uh, written by a school yeah. teacher and just kind of, it's not necessary to have that full, uh, you know, detailed view of it to be able to have this intimate experience with it and and get as clear of a picture of how it all works but that being said, I do also like it when people nerd out and start studying the anatomy and physiology of the eyes as well. Um, Absolutely. So I'm nerdish like that too. <laughs> I love anatomy. Yeah. Um, but I want to tell you something. I think that Bates didn't have, a, could not avoid that. He was a doctor. And I think when yeah. you try to convince the, you know, the uh, scientific uh, world, you have to use terms that they consider important. However, there's something that I really love about Bates, the Bates method, and that's why I connect with it so much. And that is, he had so much trust in his clients and in their body and their ability. Like, he witnessed miraculous things happening in his office just by trusting and, and really 
being very open to people's experience and how they how they ex- expressed it and understanding their their tendencies and their character and finding the right exercise to the right client this is not medical at all this is pure humanism <laughs> like really trusting people and trusting you know, trusting in something bigger there. And that's something that I admire and really um, connect with in the the Bates method. The Paula method, how it, it, maybe that particular exercise isn't right for you at this time. And it's like the same idea with the Bates thing. It's like, if this doesn't work, just let it go, try something else. And it's just a very personalized, yeah, humanistic kind of approach. Right, because he understood something very important, that if we try to help the body and we force it to do something that doesn't feel right to you, to us, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's the opposite way. It doesn't, it cannot work this way. If we want to help the body, we have to trust it. And if it doesn't like something, then we say, okay, what would work here? And we do that. Otherwise, there's resistance. And from resistance, we can't get to balance and health it just doesn't work this way (laughs) yeah i think that that word trust is really important and i I kind of realized myself that even just the act of me putting my glasses on or my contacts in when i woke up in the morning was an act of me stating that i didn't trust myself i didn't trust my own eyes i didn't trust my own ability to see or to function and it, it like I, I had just completely given up on on my yeah, my my own body's ability to to do this, what I eventually started to consider a, you know, a birthright kind of, you know, like we we deserve to have this your easy, clear, effortless eyesight. And yeah, so it, it when you were saying, you know, don't force the body to do something that is going against what the body needs, it just kind of made me think of all those years of me putting glasses on. And kind of going against the grain, you know, my body was trying to send me this signal through the blur and the myopia and the astigmatism. And instead of listening to it or believing it, the the glasses were worn. And then it was kind of, it's almost almost like I was gaslighting myself. (laughs) It's like, oh, no, there's no problem here. Everything's fine. You know, just keep on going, you know, nothing to see here. And then, but, but from within my body's like, well, wait, what? Like, what about the signal that I need to get through? So yeah, I just, once again, see a really, really big link there between this philosophy uh, from the Paula method with, with the Bates approach too. I love the process, like how you explained the process that you were going through and like saying, this is my birthright to see without glasses, but I do want to say something about this. It's amazing that you realized it and, you know, well, look where it took you, right? It's, it's phenomenal. But also I want to point out, you trusted other people. There were doctors right. and parents and teachers and other people in society that told you, listen, Nathan, this is the way you trusted in their good intentions that they want, you know, you want what's best. They wanted what's best for you. Yeah, And you trusted that. At some point, though, your body was stronger than that, telling mm-hmm. you, no, 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 we don't need that. <laughs> you know, it's that like, that's like you reclaiming your own uh, birthrights. Yeah. However, it is also really important to be compassionate during a process like this and to know that sometimes we have also to trust the body's own pace. But for some people, it takes time. I want to give an example from my experience when I I had uh, severe asthma from birth. Mm -hmm. And when I started taking polar um, classes, the first thing that happened that I went to a catastrophic asthma attack. And that was really horrible. I had to take cortisone. I had to take all kinds of medications. I got so scared. I didn't want to do polar anymore. Mm-hmm. Luckily, my husband told me, listen, if that is so powerful that it draw, drove, you, it drove you into this horrible asthma attack, it, it lasted three or four months, that attack. Wow. He said, maybe this method is very powerful. And that is true. The method is very gentle, but very powerful and potent. Uh-huh. 
And my practitioner kept telling me, take your inhalers. Like we would start in a, 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 um, a lesson and my breathing started active, like acting like it's, it's going to get into an attack. And she'd say, we, we don't have to fight it. Take your medications. And for many years, I kept taking my, my medications until I trusted the body enough that I got rid of the asthma at the age of 40, mm. which is not usually the age you get rid of asthma that you had from birth. Like usually yeah. if it lasts beyond your 20s, you have to live with it. <clears throat> but, you know, I'm now 50. So for 10 years, I had no asthma attacks, wow. nothing. So it worked. <laughs> It was just over, but we didn't do it like, you know, cold turkey. No, yeah. For many years, I kept doing the pola and taking the medications at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, it was a gradual and very gentle process for my body until it was ready for the big leap. Totally. Yeah, I mean, that's the same <laughs> approach I took with my glasses. I definitely didn't just do the cold turkey. I, over a period of four years, I was still using them for certain situations and as I was working my prescription down and yeah, it, I was just talking to a student yesterday about not holding any kind of grudges against our eye doctors from the past or from, you know, parents or teachers or anything. And actually <laughs> not only that, but actually giving gratitude for what you shared of, Oh, they had my best interest in mind that, you know, and, um, and it, that all led, like you said, look at where you are now that all that stuff leads you to where you are. So, um, yeah, it's a good, good little reminder there. Yeah, just to do everything with compassion and love to ourselves, and and yes, I I I, I do very much connect with your rebellious inner self. I also feel that the, the polar method may be a lot more, made me a lot more rebellious than I used to be, because once we're connected with the body, we just cannot not trust it or believe the signals we have to pursue it but that's why i think it's so important to connect people with this knowledge or with this um kind of work so that people are just simply more empowered and more authentic with who they are and what they want to achieve in life and how they just want to live their daily life without any excuses and without feeling like they're doing anything wrong mm -hmm. Yeah, that I mean, that that stuck out when when you were kind of introducing yourself at the beginning of how this isn't just about fixing the breathing or the posture or, you know, one one particular thing. It really I mean, you, you really shared how it really transformed your whole life and, and how you live your life. And so also, once again, another overlap with Paula and Bates of. It's not just about the eyes. You start the Bates work and, and you realize how other things start to transform as well. Yeah. And you did mention that you're, uh, that this is, it was um, formed in Israel and you mentioned that it, it's more accessible and kind of popular in Israel and maybe not, not quite as big in the U S or, or other countries. So yeah, I, not even slightly. <laughs> so um if people are curious about, you know, learning more about it or, or learning more about you, where would you maybe send people? Um, to my website, which is gracefullies.com. Gracefully is one word. And um, people can find uh, three major things or main things in, in, the, in the website. First of all, they can read a little bit about me, about the method and about the work that I do. I do have to say that I'm a serious procrastinator. So you will not even find a clue about me being a vision educator in the website. It's just something that I have to do and I haven't yet. Nevertheless, uh, the kind of work is the same kind of work either way. Um, there is a link in my website to two dig digital courses that might interest people who want to try an experiment on their own. I have a small uh, audio course that's working on the breathing only. I call it three days for better breathing and it has three recordings of 20 minutes chat sessions, just letting people work with polar exercises to deepen and make, to deepen their breath and make it effortless. And I have another course there that I called Polar Method Fundamentals. 
in which people can find 30 basic exercises of the method, some of which we practice today. Um, and they can just exper experiment with the method on their own and see what, it, what these exercises do to them, you know, just spontaneously. Um, so that's in my website. Cool. And there is a contact form uh, to get in touch with me in case somebody wants to try a session one-on-one, -on -one, which is, I think, the best way to experience this method. And the last thing is my mailing list. Again, I'm a procrastinator, so I don't send out many emails, barely four emails a year. But when I start a new group set, uh, class or when I have a new offering or something new to <laughs> let my clients know about, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is the most direct way to connect with me and hear about my offerings. That's just, uh, just join the mailing list. And don't worry, I will not bombard you with emails just because I... <laughs> too lazy to do that <laughs> so graceful is <laughs> graceful is .com. that's where you can find me nice yeah graceful ease yeah and i'll put that link uh in the description as well for people to check out thank you so much <laughs> but yeah hopefully even just listening today people have have gotten a little you know brief introduction to to what the Paula method is and how you go about teaching it and uh, I really also appreciate you kind of breaking down the different levels of it, kind of the more sort of surface level of it. And then kind of that next level that that you really focus on with the chain reactions and really, really figuring out how can we kind of be like figuring out what this is telling us and and then, you know, what that will lead to in, in the people that you work with. So, yeah, I wanted to see if there were any. Um, any any final thoughts before we start to wrap things up or, or anything that we maybe haven't touched on or anything to kind of wrap up with today? Not really. I think that somehow this conversation took us to all, you know, all different uh, directions that were very interesting for me. So I thank you for that. And I, yeah, I feel satisfied with what we, what we, ta we talked about and also the little um, exercise um experiment that we did i feel most comfortable just teaching exercises and working with people more than talking about my work so uh thank you for you know just giving us the opportunity to do that i didn't think that we will do that today and it was great yeah i really and appreciate that because yeah we could we could talk about it but i think to to give people a little experience with it at least for me that that's the kind of thing that lasts in my memory more so so absolutely Perhaps one thing that I could add is that, as you mentioned, natural vision practitioners tend to work with the other muscles and have sometimes have less knowledge about how to approach and work with uh, ring muscle and sphincter work or sphincter related issues like, um, I don't know, like um, overturning, you know, eyes that are overly moist or overly dry. You know, the little openings are sphincters too, and some problems with the dilation of the uh, pupil, uh, unless there is complete catastrophic damage to the nerves there, we can try and help uh, rebring uh, the pupil or the iris of the eye to um, better function. Mm. And also that we're really good at working on complex issues because because this work is so holistic and we don't choose for the body what to do, when people have something that is very complex and it's the eyes and the head and the this and that and all together, the polar method might be a quicker way to solve the problems, you know, at the same time, because the body has the, the tendency many times to work in many things simultaneously and therefore to solve different problems, even if we weren't even thinking that we're going to solve them. Uh, yeah. all at the same time or around the same time yeah it's like you can kind of have your own game plan going into it and then be surprised to find oh wow i, I guess i needed that as well <laughs> something that you weren't maybe <laughs> yeah. expecting mm -hmm. that's true <laughs> you you just got me thinking of, of maybe one one more little question or um if there were a sort of a brief way for you to kind of brainstorm this like 
let's say somebody comes to see you and like one of your their pupils doesn't constrict the same as the other one or maybe it's just not really responding what maybe would be sort of like a, a way to start to maybe approach that would it be like starting with the the surface layer the orbicularis oculi muscle to kind of go to that involuntary one or or would you maybe even start with something like we did today with the breathing or the tongue or the eye, like other muscles um, I'd probably start with hands over eyes or palming. And first of all, just observe that person, what they do during palming. How's the breathing? Is there any movement in the body? Is there any tendency? I'd be really interested to hear what they have to tell me about their experience. So once they cover their eyes, is there anything that's going coming up? A memory? colors, sounds, sensations, what is it that the body kind of like um, naturally brings up? And I'll follow that and that will direct me to the work. Of course, I'll also have to listen to their history and yeah. you know, what are other things that their medical history uh, is composed of? I don't know if you can say that in English, you know, just to know their medical history and from all these pieces of information, their history, how I observe the body while they're in hands over eyes, what they share with me, we will let the body gradually lead us to what will help it heal in the most pleasant and efficient way. So I will not decide it for that person. We right. will work together. And many times the first, I don't know, two or three or sometimes a little more first sessions are really kind of like creating a new dialogue between me and that new client and between the client and his or her body. Yeah. And from there, kind of like a new horizon opens and then we see where to take the work from there. But the body will give us a lot of information. So we just have to stay open and right. listen and observe and trust. <laughs> That's my, I'm sorry that it's not a simple answer, but well, when you see it happen, yeah. it is very simple. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. It, 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 it's, that is a simple answer is, is that each person is, is completely unique. And it, it's exciting to think about that instead of going to work with all these people and just doing the same thing for everyone, you don't know what you're going to do and, and you get to find out in, in real time with them. And that, that's just beautiful. I think that's, uh, that's what I look forward to when I wake up and I'm, I've got a full day of vision lessons. It's like, you know, it's not like I'm just going to be doing repeating myself with the same, you know, thing over the, it's like, everything is so different. Everything is so unique and, uh, that's what makes it fun and interesting, I think. So Absolutely. It's the creation, the creativity, and also the the interaction with different people that makes it so interesting. And each person and each story is a whole, you know, universe, new universe for us. And we just, we're being invited in, thanks to these clients of ours, to this fascinating story. And we're just, you know, walking the path with them. It's beautiful, really. It is. Well, mm -hmm. and your your description of, of the the method and, and your work is beautiful as well. I know you said you prefer to just teach it and not talk about it, but I think you do a good drop great job of uh, introducing people to it and explaining how it works. So <laughs> wanna thank you for coming on the show today and, and sharing this with my audience. And uh, yeah, hopefully it will get people a little interested once again to keep exploring these amazing complementary approaches that will assist their pre-existing vision routine or Bates routine or health routine, whatever that might be. So yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all this with us today. Michal, this has been amazing. Thank you so, so much. Really, I had so much fun with you. So I really appreciate your time and your uh, sincere inter uh, interest in whatever we were talking about. This was just absolutely great. And I thank you for having me here. Awesome. So once again, uh, check out Mikal's website, gracefulease.com and stay tuned for 
Oh, and if you want to hear from more of the other presenters from the conference, if you haven't listened to the last episode, uh, check that out. Otherwise, stay tuned for more episodes of the Naked Eye podcast coming out. And we will hopefully check in with you again next month.